an informal intro, but I've been doing interviews for this series, the best for the business series. Uh, I started it last year and it's basically to really introduce the people behind the scenes and highlight some more of the positive aspects of the wrestling business. And I kind of wanted to do it uh, in place of a traditional year end awards, just because it, it, there's really no diversity. I feel like when it comes to that and sure. you know, this is, this is a way to, as I said, not only be show the more positive side of wrestling, but really uh, just find out what's going on, like on it, on several different levels. Like I've talked to executives, uh, you not only for the people that are tuning into this, uh, run warrior wrestling but you're also the principal of marion catholic high school in illinois mm -hmm. chicago suburbs um and i just think you know it's a really interesting discussion to have because not only of what's going on with COVID and wrestling but you also have to deal with it on another front as an administrator and in the school system so uh if people aren't familiar can you just talk about warrior wrestling i know it's a non-profit and just the mission statement of the promotion and what you guys try to do for your community sure so uh warrior wrestling is now gosh about three years old we started it in december of 17 the first show was may of 18 and essentially it combines uh my two passions in life and some of my friends and other crew members two passions in life which is education and helping kids and pro wrestling and i had pitched the idea originally to my boss the president of our school in december of 2017 that um you know what if we kind of took a crazy idea for a fundraiser and we held a wrestling show at the school and so we we did the first show in may of 2018 and we have now done 12 shows over the course of the last three years 18 19 and 20 and um, it's really kind of grown into a, a life of its own. It went from a one-time kind of a special crazy thing to becoming an, an ongoing promotion. And as you said, um, the money from the promotion goes back to the school to help kids with scholarships. And the, the way that that happens varies. The first several shows, the school ran the shows and then profited or lost based on things. We actually have, have split it off into a separate LLC now. And essentially the LLC makes a flat donation to the school every show in the amount of whatever is made plus X amount, et cetera. So that way it just kind of separates the, the group out. So there's no liability issues for the school and other things like that. But um, yeah, it's been an incredible journey, incredible ride. And our hope is to put on super indie shows that attract wrestling fans as well as families. And in the meantime, do some good for the wrestlers in the school and everybody else. Some of the last shows that you had for 2020 were the Warrior Wrestling Stadium Series and uh, I I know you sent out and put it on social media, but like all of the extensive guidelines and restrictions you, you had in place and really made it not only safe for wrestling fans, but it was a it's a family event and you had the three stadium series events at the end of the year. And you just talk about like how, how do you balance that? Because obviously you have your job as in the school, but is there any sort of uh, negotiating you have to do? Like, is it easier because you're in the position you are? Like, just walk people through because you could say, okay, well, I have, I'm the principal, like I can use the stadium, but it's obviously not that cut and dry. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, so the principal is kind of the chief academic officer of the school. Um, th there's a president who, who runs the school, like runs the whole operation. And so everything has to get cleared through him. And um, there obviously is a, a benefit to being the principal in that I, I work in the space. I can, I can be responsible for it, but there also comes with that a great deal of responsibility, right? So inviting, we have to be very, very particular about how we do things and how we invite people in. And, and in the COVID era, not just ethically, but for the school as well. How do we make sure we keep everybody safe? So there's definitely benefits that come with it, but there's also challenges and responsibilities and those things balance out. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask was in relation to that, um, I, I know you, you mentioned 
uh, you called it like a super indie show. How did that affect bringing talent in this year? Because you've seen not you know not only Warrior but all over the country. It's almost a uh, formula at this point where you bring in like the big names and then you have your your regional names and the local names and it you know you put all the the cart match cards together. But how did like travel and bringing in talent? Uh, how was that affected by COVID? Because you have some people that can't travel, you have some people that don't want to, all these different variables. So how did you find the right balance of putting on, you know, not only all year, but especially the last couple of the stadium shows? Uh, excellent question. So our, our first outdoor one was in August. We called it Friday Night Lights. And that was kind of the test case. And it, and it went well. So then we did the, the three stadium shows in September. But it, exactly as you said, in, in a normal Warrior show, usually we would do four shows a year. And we fly in anywhere from 18 to 25 talents to do this these giant, giant shows with big names. Well, travel was incredibly restricted and also not necessarily safe, even if it wasn't restricted. So when we set out to do that first show in August, we knew we were going to minimize the number of people we flew in for their safety, for our safety, and just for a logistical you know, standpoint of, of being able to do it. So we went from 20 something on average to I think we flew in four people for Friday Night Lights. I think it was Cage, Archer, Janella, and um, Jeff Cobb. That four and, and everybody else drove. So safety wise, that hopefully made it safer and, and um, eliminated some headaches as well. But that, but that's something you got to think about. You know, in, in a normal year, you plan all these things. As we plan these shows, we had to plan for all right. What happens if a third of our talent can't make it? Let's say we book Brian Cage and then Brian Cage gets COVID or has to quarantine. Then what are our backups tonight? So there was just so many contingency plans and so much thought went into how do we do this safely. And then how do we adapt if it all goes down the tubes? So it definitely made it more difficult and it made us have to get more creative in our matchmaking because, you know, if we'd normally fly in this person or that person, well, we're not going to do that. How do we find those regional talents, like you said, or how do you get somebody who's coming from somewhere to pair up with somebody else? Or in many cases, pick a guy up. I can't tell you how many times as the promoter, I call one guy and say, hey, you're coming in from X. Can you swing around to Y and get that guy? We'll give you a couple bucks for bringing him in and, and, and make it all work. So it was a lot of logistical challenges. But at the same time, though, that's part of the fun. You know, that's part of the, the challenge of, of can you do this to your normal standard with these new hindrances put on you? Like, bring it on. Is that something that you want to consciously carry forward next year? Like, I don't really, maybe you can talk about some of the events you're trying to plan for 2021, but as far as that behind the scenes aspect, is that is that something you're going to carry forward or try to roster wise next year? Probably. Um, you know, we always, we, we kind of joke internally that we book every show like it's our last. Like if, if we, you know, if we if we're sitting on a great match, oh, we won't do that for several shows. We do it. We, we, every show we put forward is hopefully the best that we can absolutely do. So I think those conversations will come when we have a sense of um, what's safe, what's logistically possible, and also where the demand is. That's another thing too. We took a big gamble with the first Friday Night Lights because it was the first show with fans. I mean, GCW had done a few small shows with fans, but we had 550 people there and it was the first large show like that. So we didn't know it was going to be large. You know, we could have spent X amount of money lining up talent and maybe only 150 people spent, you know, felt comfortable spending money and, and coming out during COVID. So I, a big part of the reason that we also limited our expenses and our fly, our fly-ins is because we didn't know how many people would want to do it. We had surveyed our, our, our uh, fans from previous shows. We had a sense, but we didn't know until we put the card up and put tickets on sale. So I think to answer your question about planning for 2021, so much of it will depend on the reality of the world. If we are still in a COVID spike zone, number one, are we running a show? Probably not. And number two, um, if, if COVID is still humming along at the same rate, how many fans do we think would safely come? And, and, and to be honest with you, we would probably do the same thing we did. We'd survey those fans who came to the four outdoor shows and say, hey, how comfortable do you feel right now? We did a show in a month. Would you want to come? And then use that as we gauge how to build the card and book the talent. What kind of reception did you have after the events or leading up to the events, maybe to contrast it? Because obviously you're getting a crowd there. People are enjoying it. 
um, minimal health risk, all things considered, what kind of reception, like on a local level or maybe from parents? Excellent question. So um, I can speak to the parents that come to the shows because the reality is like school parents and school kids and people always are like, oh my gosh, it's got to be so cool. All the kids have to love it. Like, it operate like wrestling happens on a Friday or Saturday night here and the rest of the school does not care. You know, there's, 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 it's just kind of like, it's off their radar. There's a very few amount of kids in the school building who care. So um, there, there's not a lot of overlap actually between my day job and, and, and wrestling because there's just those circles don't cross. But what we did see actually quite a bit of in these outdoor shows, and we made kids free for the outdoor show. 16 and under was free. We dropped all of our ticket prices. We tried to make it because people were hurting, people were out of work. We wanted to make it as accessible as possible. We definitely saw a really large uptick in the number of families that came to the outdoor shows versus the last two big indoor arena shows that we did. And, um, to a T. Uh, our staff would hang out at the gates as people were leaving. How did it go? Did you guys enjoy yourselves? So many parents thanked our, our staff and volunteers. They just said, thank you for giving us something to do and for doing it safely. Like, I feel like I can bring my kids here. We sit in our own little bubble on the field. We eat our own snacks. We go home. I never once felt like it was dangerous for my kids. And it got me to be able to get my kids out of the house. So we saw a giant uptick in kids and families for these four shows. And that might continue to, regardless of what our booking is. We might continue along that same line for families because I, I think there's people that are that are hungry for, for something for their kids and their family like this. Yeah. And I think bigger picture, you could say it, it, not just wrestling, like my kids, I can speak from personal experience. Like they went, they went back to school and I'm, I'm just like, they, they, they crave that like they need that yeah. in-person interaction and as, as safe and convenient as technology is you still need that interaction especially yes. the younger you are so i think there's always going to be that pushback right now this year why are you you know like i yep talk to so many people like if you don't support running events that okay that's fine but there are people that are doing it and they're doing it in a safe way like you guys and i feel like as long as it may it, as long as it continues to be a safe and healthy outlet for what's going on right now like let's encourage it and find creative ways for kids to really deal with this and try to let the time pass and if that's wrestling if that's art whatever like let's encourage it absolutely and it's the same discussion that we have during my day job here at school, which is if we can do it safely, then we should do it. If we can't do it safely, we shouldn't do it. And I think that's the difference, right? Like it's not, it's not binary. It's not either you're doing something and it's unsafe or you're not doing it, therefore it's safe. If it can be done safely and you can do everything right, then go for it. And I say that to all other promoters and other people too, go for it, you know, give it a shot if you're committed to doing it safely. And I think for us, you know, we said when we launched the, the stadium series, so Friday Night Lights was the proof of concept in August. Then we said, we're going to do this three more times before the weather turns cold here in Chicago, because we knew, and we said this up front, we're probably done till next May, because we, we couldn't foresee how we could do it safely indoors in a way that's economically viable. We just like, and, and we still don't, you know, because right now we're under a limit of 50 people in a space in Illinois. We can't put on the, the caliber of show that Warrior Wrestling likes to be with 50 paying fans. It just doesn't, the, the school would lose money. It doesn't add up economically. So we knew ahead of time, the way to do it safely is outdoors. We crammed in three shows outdoors. Then we packed up the circus for the winter and, and we'll be back when we can do it safely again almost certainly outdoors. So, so that's the key. So if there's people right now in Texas, in Florida, in California, and you can do it outdoors, find a way to do it outdoors. But indoors, we're still not sold on. Are you kind of sticking to May no matter what? Yeah, I mean, unless something changes, unless we wake up in the middle of February and the virus is gone, you know, like you wake up and there's beautiful snowfall for Christmas. If we wake up and COVID is over, I will plan a wrestling show the next day. But um, unless we've got very clear safety guidelines, we're most likely going to wait until we can do it outdoors again in late spring. And I, I've seen some of the matches. I've seen some of the shows and talked to a lot of the talent on the cards. There, there's some really awesome in-ring work. Um, do, do you 
not to put you on the spot or anything or single anybody out, but like, is there anybody you really, really like to work with in particular or any group of people just because, you know, they might not be a Chicago person, but, you know, they understand what you're trying to do and, you know, give back to your community. Like anybody come to mind on that? Yeah, there's a handful. You know, we we talk about this a lot. Our team does. We're not only looking for great performers, we're looking for great people. Because as as, as anybody in wrestling has or any other type of art or sport, we've worked with people who are pains in the butt, who are great performers, but not great to work with or not great team players. And we've really kind of weeded those things out and figured out who we are and what type of show we run. And the talent has figured out who we are, what type of show we run. And those two things match, right? It's kind of like um, romantically people hanging out in groups and certain people gra gravitate to each other. I think it's the same thing professionally. You know, we want to work with people who are open-minded, easygoing, not egotistical, help others out, pitch in, et cetera. And for us, that's been Brian Cage, Lance Archer, Sam Adonis, Tessa Blanchard, the Rascals, Brian Pillman, I mean, people who are great humans. You know, it's funny when we did the, um, the Friday Night Lights, we hadn't seen any of the talent since February. And it was like a family reunion. Like everybody was so happy to see each other. And like everybody wanted to hug everybody, but it was like, ah, oh, no, elbow bump. But like, that's what we want. We want to create an atmosphere where it is not carny. It is not competitive. It's just performers performing together. And, and all those people I just listed, you know, there's never any arguments about creative or finishes or, or any of that kind of stuff. It's always like, well, what do we want to do tonight? What, what, how are we going to, how are we going to get things done and put on a great show? Uh, Tom Lawler is another one. Oh my God. Tom Lawler is possibly the greatest person on planet earth. Um, he's a guy who, because he's been a professional athlete and a real fighter, knows that pro wrestling is pretend and it's fun and he'll do whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. And it'll, it'll go back and forth with ideas. So all of those people that I just listed, I'm sure I'm missing some people. I apologize to those that I am, um, are great to work with because they're great humans behind the scenes as far as work ethic and how they treat one another and how they treat fans and how they work with us. I would do any job with those people, not just wrestling. Do you have a, so for context, when the pandemic kind of hit, I started doing a watch list feature mm -hmm. and I was really just asking for content to watch, like whether it's new content or repeat, just asking people I speak with for match recommendations. And obviously we've kind of gotten past that point where there is new content. So that's good. But as far as it still being, uh, a way to go back into the archives. Is there a match in particular, or maybe a favorite show you have that you've run that, you know, really highlights what kind of wrestling you just talked about, you know, good people behind the scenes and in the ring, or just one that would really get people excited and show off some really, you know, just a good match. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, it's like asking to pick one of your favorite children. Um, I, I think they all the different shows have have different um, specialness to them. I was actually just rewatched one of our shows last night. I was riding on my bike indoors, and uh, we're we're planning this fifty greatest matches countdown that we're going to do on YouTube starting in January. And so I was rewatching some of the stuff. Warrior Wrestling Seven stands out as having a great mix of all of the things that we try to do. There's a couple of great Lucha matches on there. There's a great heavyweight match with Sam Adonis and Michael Elgin. Um, and then in the back half, you know, we joke that the back nine of Warrior 7, intermission onwards, is maybe the strongest back nine we've ever done because it's Lance Archer, Brian Pillman, and then Minoru Suzuki, Tom Lawler, then Brian Cage, ELP, and then the big match, the Rascals versus Osprey, Amazing Red, and Rocky Romero. So that the back nine or the back 40 of that show, I put up against any four match streak anywhere. So if somebody's listening and they, they've never watched Warrior Wrestling, right now on the top of my mind is Warrior 7. I would say start there. And if you've only got you know an hour and a half, start with the, the intermission and go from there. Yeah, I, I, that, that actually is a good one. I talked to Trey Miguel and he also picked that, that same match. He talked about how, uh, how much Amazing Red meant to him and just, you know, getting a chance to work with him and 
they, you know, they said they embraced and they, they were crying after the match and it was just, yeah. you know, if that doesn't sell it, like you're, you're talking to two people that have two different experiences with that same match, like go check it out. I think, um, yeah. And I can even tell you, so another fun story about that match so normally. So the, we are very blessed because we, we, we work in the school. So we actually beam all the matches the, the the green room for the wrestlers is our cafeteria, our student union. It's got all these TVs all around it. So we stream the show to those TVs. So while the wrestlers are eating after their matches or preparing, whatever, they can watch the shows. It's going on live. Literally the entire locker room came out of the cafeteria, came through the curtain. And we're watching that match in the arena. All of the luchadors were maskless, just sitting on the bleachers. Brian Cage, who had wrestled the previous match, went back to the cafeteria, grabbed a plate full of pizza, and then came out, took his boots off. So he was in trunks, bare feet, with a plate of pizza sitting on the stage, watching the Rascals Osprey match. It was surreal. But that, that tells you the caliber of that match because of the way the boys and girls all reacted to it. That, that, wow. <laughs> uh, so you guys can, uh, anybody watching this can check out the match. It's available for free on high spots. Um, when we put this up, we'll also link to it. But um, uh, again, there, there's so many good matches that you could pull from. Uh, besides high spots, whether it's stream, the streaming service or people want to buy the DVD, where else can people check out? warrior wrestling content uh high spots has all the shows to stream as is fight tv so if you'd like to instead of subscribing to high spots if you'd like to just buy an individual show they're up on fight tv as well high spots also houses our dvds so if you like to order on dvd the regular high spots site has those uh we've got merch at, at pro wrestling tees or at our website which is warriorwrestling.net um, really if people are hearing for the first time we'd love to have you uh check it out and give us your feedback we Try to put together a buffet of wrestling, all different types and styles on each of the shows. So uh, check us out if you're looking for new content. And we've had a lot of great people cycle through Warrior. So we'd like to share that with everybody. Yeah. Steve Tortorello of Warrior Wrestling. You, plenty of ways you can help support the brand until we see them back in the ring. Uh, hopefully this spring everything goes well. Uh, Good. you're doing a good thing for a good cause and i you know i'm glad i got a chance to talk to you about this it, it's worth highlighting the good in pro wrestling especially after such an up and down year yeah. i appreciate uh taking the time to talk to me today bill great to talk to you